When we do a little sh a ceremony with uh, our children, it's all about teaching for a good life for the future. And we use water because water is very, very sacred and we need water to live. And in the past, there's been uh, lots of uh, water ceremonies done by women. Elders and children are part of it, boys and girls. And also we use uh, our sacred plants, seeds, and sweet grass and uh, tobacco was offered to me so we can come here and share our little ceremony that we do at home. And uh, here also I brought a, a rock. This is a turtle and this was found under 17 feet of earth. There was a house being built in there and some kids went down there and they couldn't come back up. They were stuck down there. So my sister went down there and she had to wait there with the kids because they were afraid. They were so down, 17 feet down. So my sister found this there and she dug it out and realized it was a, a rock. It turned to rock, but it's a turtle. So and then this one here, my father gave us this one long time ago. And uh, we've had this ever since. Like our family has used it for a ceremony. And then we use a drum. Our drum is made out of a buffalo hide. And there's wood at the back here, a tree, and raw hide. And then we use this drumstick and we, we hit the drum. 
and this is like our telephone to great spirit we use that in our prayer so i find today it's very very important that we uh we use ceremonies with our children it doesn't matter who who, who they are you know a lot of non first nation people join us to be a part of our ceremonies and we allow that to happen you know because we share this world that we live in we share everything and that we have to learn to get along our problems are no different from across the world we all have the same common problems you know li living problems unmanageable lives but that we believe because of uh, historically what happened to us uh, what happened to our ancestors and our grandparents we've lost our way because of a uh, residential school and children being a uh, the 60s scoop being taken away up for adoption losing your family is such a a crisis in the person's life you know your spirit is just ripped apart to be taken away from your mother and to be put someplace else where you don't know anybody and sometimes you're stuck there for a long long time sometimes until you're old enough you get out if you're lucky your parents will get well and they will take you they'll take you back and I've always been interested in uh, children my family to me is very very important you know to have a family to have a grandmother grandfather and all you all the family that you need that's so important to me because you're never alone you have a problem there'll always be somebody there to help you like I always bring this doll with me here I went to Ottawa and this lady travels all over and when she saw this doll she thought about me and bought it and this doll is made out of cloth that a uh, recycling cloth they wash the cloth and it's a woman with braids and she's got a little doll she's holding her little doll and that grandmother that made this doll she sold it to this lady and that money she got she went and bought food so she could feed her grandchildren so all over the world it's like that grandmothers you know help out to feed their grandchildren you know in Canada we're kind of lucky like uh, you know w there's a lot of uh, help we can help one another but in the other countries it's so hard you know where there's earthquakes all kinds of disasters happening you know but we go back to parenting it's so important to parent our children the way our ancestors did the parenting long time ago when they used teepees as for the teepee teachings you know the poles and even the pegs all around the teepee and in front of the teepee there's pegs there inside there it's like a woman and the teepee is like her her dress her body you know they sit in there for teachings they slept there they cooked in there and then the storms came through you know teepees never ever blown down because of the way they were built you know and our ancestors learned that from uh, you know the birds their uh, nests are round because uh, when something is round the wind can't knock it down not like a square building you know and the and the wind can travel on the teepee like this and it goes so it's never been stories about teepees are blowing down long time ago but they used the uh, hides today now it's more common to use tarp to make teepees because it's easier hide is so hard to get buffalo hides you know they're so expensive that uh, people wouldn't be able to afford to make them so they use tarp and long time ago when a baby was going to be born when a baby was on the way a newborn baby was conceived you know the grandfathers we were told would take their drums and their pipes and they would do a ceremony this uh, this man told us is a very very old man he's passed on now that's what they did long time ago when a woman uh, was announced that she was going to have a baby they would pray right away and then that time when a baby when that child was born there would be six sets of parents waiting for this child to be born you know the, the you know the, ch the the child's mother and the ch and the and the girl's mother and the mother's mother and sometimes there'd be five generations you know when the child was born 
so they would all be waiting for this child today. You know, today it's so different. I've seen young women going to the hospital, giving birth to their babies. Nobody's there for them, no one. So we've lost a lot of our ways. And, it, and when you take a child from a, a, you know, a mother, it hurts so much that some of these women never recover. You know, they pass on because of, you know, the drug world. They get caught up in uh, drugs because they miss their children so much because these children are on loan to us. So we have to do everything we can to keep children together, you know, to keep them together because they have something that nobody could ever give them, money could never buy. So and children are very, very sacred and they're on loan to us. So and then when, when the child is born, a name was given to the child. You know, the child would carry this sacred name for the rest of its life. The parents, the grandparents, they would, uh, you know, look after this child. Everybody, the whole community would raise this child to help one another. Like there's lots of stories about people a long time ago when a woman died giving birth and then a newborn baby was left there and everybody in the community had to pitch in to give this child you know milk you know another mother would breastfeed this child and sometimes there would be two mothers you know involved in breastfeeding this child until this child was able to eat uh, solid foods but there was always will a way to survive and times were hard, you know, they talk about the 19, 1929, 1930, we only hear stories about those. My grandmother told us lots of stories about the hardships. And then the men went to war, you know, the Second World War, the First World War. There was one man from our community, he went to the two wars. And he left his family each time, you know, and, uh, you know, he came back. And we must never, even those ones are history, they fought over there, all because of this Canada, this place that we live in. They're gonna attack a clean place, Canada, that's what it means. You know, they, they did that for us, and I hope the veterans are never, ever, ever forgotten, because in our family, we talk about my father as if he was alive. You know, the things that he told us about uh, when he went to war, why he went over there. And at the same time, he was also, uh, he went to boarding school and he was an orphan by the time he was a teenager. And all the things that he had to go without parents, you know, go without grandparents and then go and fight in the war and come back and do his best to be a parent. And then in the end also they got, um, they didn't get the payment they were supposed to have got because of they were supposed to have been a treaty. First Nation people that time, they were treaty Indians we were referred to. They were supposed to have gotten some land, but because they lived on reservations, they, they were never given that land. So they were ripped off where other non-native people, they got the land. And today their children still farm on there. Us, we're still stuck in the towns or else uh, in, in a community on a reserve. Like we're, we're like, it's like we could not be free. There's a history about that. All the treatment that we endured, you know, through uh, being First Nation people, but today now, because of organizations, people getting well, getting an education, you know, they're coming back to look after their own people, you know, look after the, the people. Like, and what I like the best is where, where, uh, where I am at is, uh, you know, working with women. They get their children back. They get to stay there with their children, you know, and they get their children back, you know. And I, and I know all those women are very, very good women. They're beautiful women. And it makes it even more beautiful when they get their children back, when they get to hold them. But there's so much missing. You know, once they, they get there, the children are already developed in different ways without the mother or the father's uh, help along the way. They have different uh, personalities. So they come back with mom. They have to rebond with the mother and they have to do things together. You know, the mother has to bond with the children. But you know what? Miracles do happen. They pick up from where they left off. It takes a little while, but you see them happy. And uh, to me, that's uh, one of the greatest things that's happening right now in this community is a woman getting their children back. What a better place. And I've seen lots of hardships where 
a woman goes to the hospital and then her baby's apprehended at the hospital because of uh, there's traces of uh, you know, chemicals that aren't supposed to be in the baby and then the baby gets apprehended. In the meantime, the baby was breastfeeding and then within 24 hours, the baby's uh, removed from her life. I've seen mothers cry so hard, you know, crying for their babies and then that's where we come in as grandmother's woman to help, you know, to bring back the children. Sometimes mom has to go for help. They go away to treatment centers and sometimes, you know, the nice part, and it's sad in a way, where that's the only place where you're going to end up in a treatment center or end up in jail, in a penitentiary, and you get to know about sweetgrass, you get to know about smuds, and you get to learn about him singing beautiful songs and, you know, going into the sweat lodge, you know, honoring your identity for who you are, that you are a worthwhile person, a beautiful human being, and you can fix yourself. You can go to the, all kinds of counseling in the world, you know, and if it doesn't wake up your spirit, you're gonna go on and on like that, eh? But when you go for help using First Nation ways and your First Nation, you know, your spirit wakes up and you want to uh, get more, you wanna learn more. And once you know the history of our people also, why we are the way we are today, that helps. Because we're not like this for nothing. Nobody wants to be troubled all the time. You know, nobody wants to live without their children, their grandchildren. They don't want to do that. But, you know, it brings people together. It mends lives. You know, our people were proud, proud people. You know, we, they were, like our, our ancestors' prayers was for us to never, ever be an industry. Never. But today now, we are an industry as women. I can speak for women. We are an industry. We lose our children, you know, to foster homes. They stay in the system. They get abused in the system. They lose their identity. No matter how much a good home they're put in, they lose their identity. They lose their language. They lose their spiritual way of life. You know, the word nokum, the word mama, you know, is so foreign that they don't even know what that means. Mama is a beautiful word. Mama ngawi, that means mother that woman that brought you into this world. And nokum means my grandmother, an ownership, a sense of belonging into that family. They will never hear those words because of the, they're in care. And then now, like it, because of the way things are today, like the residential schools are long gone, you know? But, uh, you know, some systems replace the residential school, like, uh, the, you know, you know, one of them is uh, Child and Family Services, you know, Correctional Services, the justice system. Like, they don't really understand. I don't think they will ever, ever understand. You know, no matter how much we tell them, it's got to be, once they, were rep once they get replaced by people that are more knowledgeable, that know their identities, and they take their, their, they take the, the, their job I think that's the only way that things are going to change because we're not to be an industry. That's not right. And um, there's so many stories like that and they tell us too now, there's more women going to jail, more women in penitentiaries. And that tells something, common sense are telling us that uh, the reason for that is because there's not the right, proper, culturally appropriate help for our people. That's why that's happening. Because if their way of counseling and help is so good, we would all get well, you know, and that's a good thing to have to all get well and live a good life, but it isn't. It's getting worse now. They're building two more penitentiaries. You know, that's a big message loud and clear. We're gonna take your children. We're gonna keep your children. You know, I, I, you know I, if I regret anything, it's that you know, our little children to be going into the penitentiaries, you know, that once they're in there, their freedom is taken away, their identity is taken away. You know, their spirits are taken away. But if they're lucky, they go to the elders in that area, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna get better, they're gonna get well, and they are gonna come home. So because of all these things that happen, that happens in, because of, in, in our history, every, I tell people, get to know our history. 
Christianity played a big role. You know, they wanted to Christianize us so we could live happily ever after. You know, and uh, like in social services, the justice system, the, you know, the world wars had something to do with it. The education system had something to do with it. All these systems played a role in the way we are today. So, but you know, I am grateful that uh, my grandmother took me for the first seven years of my life before I went to residential school. She planted some seeds in me that are embedded in me so strong that uh, nobody could ever, ever uh, make me stop using my language or to stop or to try and make me another person rather than who I'm meant to be is an Ehiosko. That they could not succeed. But, but in the end, I suffered lots, you know, going to the residential school. And I wouldn't want uh, what happened to us for it to happen ever again in the future generation. That should not ever, ever happen again. But we need to be strong. We have to be united. You know, we got to be physically, mentally, spiritually strong. We got to know our limits, you know, that drugs and alcohol are not good. Prescription drugs abused are not good. Everything we bring into our circle, we bring drugs, you know, marijuana, we bring pills, you know, everything in our home. We are the teachers, we are the professors. Our children are gonna see that. And if we're drinking and we're doing drugs, we don't have a right to tell people, stop drinking, stop taking drugs, because that's what we're doing and they're not gonna listen to us. And so that's how it starts. You become the role model, the good or bad role model. Both of them are very, very effective. And to be, uh, you know, if a one is a being a bad role model, if the people aren't physically, mentally, spiritually strong in their home, that's the life they're going to follow. But if you're good role models, good things are going to happen. But at the same time, also, there is no guarantee that this person is going to stay straight forever and ever because there's lots of interruptions in, in this uh, life we have, you know, lots. But, you know, uh, when, when we go back to our teachings about life, you know, caring for children, you know, giving the best life for these children. You could be poor, you know, you could, you know, you don't need to be rich to give a good life to a child. What you need is love, you know, caring, knowing, you know, how the children are feeling, getting to know each other, you know, telling them stories about life, you know, what's going to happen, and taking them to elders, taking them to knowledgeable people. You know, even though like uh, the word elder is not really uh, our way to, it's uh, non-native people giving that to us. Like to us, an uh, elder is uh, like of another, uh, you know, ministry people, the Mormons, they call each other elders. But us, uh, they, they would call them, you know, Keteak. Keteak is somebody older and knowledgeable, knowledgeable about life. And that person had to have been a young man, you know, and then a parent, and then an adult, and then became a grandfather, and became a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and has been in, the, in his, the children's lives all along, sometimes five generations of families. You know, that, that's what we talk about when we talk about, you know, parenting. We get parenting from everybody. I remember things that uh, was passed on to us by other grandmothers, other grandparents, you know, when maybe we didn't behave properly, so we would be taken to this home. My grandmother would always give a gift to somebody, maybe dry berries, and would tell my grandmother, this one is acting up, does not listen at home. I came here to help me do something so her, her life can change. So, and then the grandmother would say, Kasta mo ta pepe, you know, come here and sit with me. And then she would hug you, and then she would tell you gently, about life, she'd tell you stories, you know, that they were non-threatening stories, you, and you, they didn't, they weren't scary stories. And then they would, she would tell you, I'm telling you this because I love you and I don't want you to get into trouble. That's how they did their counseling. And then a little child would be throwing a tantrum, didn't want to do anything, just crying, because something maybe is happening at home, that's why this child is having a tantrum. Instead of sending this child to the bedroom or yelling at the child, you take a blanket, no matter how cold it is, wrap the child, step outside, 
and when the child takes inhales deep breathing you know from crying that cold air is going to hit and wake up her little spirit and she'll stop crying or he will stop crying and then you talk to the child and tell him look look what's outside here they'll see the birds they'll see the vehicles and then smoke is coming out of your mouth because it's so cold out there and then the finally the child rests on your uh, shoulder and then you know the child is coming out and getting over from this tantrum and then you hold the child and you sing a lullaby to the child and usually after you do that the child is falling asleep because it took so much out of this child to through this tantrum and and sometimes what happens is when people don't know our ways of uh, parenting they'll put the child in a bedroom and shut the door and yell at them some more when you finish crying you come out you know or real scary uh, ways of parenting so those ones now we have to put those ones away those are history those are the ways that took our people to the penitentiaries and that took children to end up in foster care because of uh, we didn't know how to parent but today we have an opportunity to learn how to become a parent and you know i had to learn to become a parent to you know to become a grandparent you know because our ways too are sometimes like uh, my grandmother spent 21 years in a boarding school you know she her ways was a loss too but she had to relearn her ways and then my mother and we were born there was eight girls in my family i always kept some of my siblings through my married life one at a time and my mom had great difficulties to become a parent and that was hard on me because i was young you know in one of my sisters you know i kept her once in a residential school i went to school with her i kept her i slept with her and then when i got married my mother sent her to come and live with me so she lived with me for about a couple years and then she went back home and uh, got married and had children you know and then uh, because of the choices that she made you know her life ended here in Saskatoon where she she got somebody beat her up and it went into a coma and ended up in a hospital and while she was in a hospital her children went up for adoption that was in the 60s she my, my sister didn't know how to parent to my mother didn't get parenting from her mother because her being in a residential school for 21 years and then me helping my siblings i had to parent them and my sister don that died you know i was so hurt when her children went up for adoption i was just devastated i have lots of letters at home to prove that how much i look for them letters to the united states you know Regina in letters, you know, I wrote letters to them to go into their adoption file. Lots of work I did, I never gave up hope. And then we found them. When we found my niece, she was ready to give up her baby. And I told her, don't give up your baby, let me raise your baby. So I did. So I raised her son for my niece. And then, you know, Creator sees that uh, how much I suffered when, the, when my sister's children went up for adoption while she was in a coma. The adoptions were finalized and that hurt me so much and then you know through creator's blessings i ended up finding them and then i ended up getting my sister's first grandchild and then i ended up getting my sister's uh, daughter she was just a little girl she was 11 months old when i got her and she weighed 13 pounds and she was uh, suffering from fetal alcohol syndrome and today she's 39 years old a beautiful girl never ever experimented on drugs and alcohol she received my secondhand smoke when I used to smoke and I didn't know any better but I, I quit smoking since it's been about maybe 10 11 years since I quit smoking I used to be addicted to nicotine and my grandchildren got after me so when I listened to them it wasn't all that hard to quit smoking because uh, you know they told me that we share this air that we breathe and my grandson told me one of these days, he says, I'm going to come home from school and I'm going to call, no, come, no, come. He says, I'm going to yell louder. And then I'm going to remember that we buried you a week ago and I have forgotten that you died of lung cancer all because of your addiction. He said, quit smoking, stop smoking now. He says, he told me and I told him that uh, I'm an adult, I can do anything I want to do, I can smoke, I told him. He says, no, you can't smoke. You're hurting us, he says. We are hurting little people. We share this air that we breathe. 
And when I do my laundry, I have to put my clothes in a garbage bag and tie a knot on it. Because if I put them in a drawer, when I get up in the morning, after I have a shower, I open my drawer to put my clean clothes on, all I smell is smoky shit. And it, makes, it, it just makes me want to get sick, he said. So stop smoking. You know, I thought about it, and then I thought he's right. So I quit smoking. And then that same, that, that grandson, the one that helped me, told me to quit smoking. I raised him, me and my husband, and uh, he's never did drugs or experimented on uh, alcohol or, or drugs, you know, but still like him too. He, he has a, a little hurt spirit. He's got five children, and uh, one of the five children is his stepson, and we accept him, we love him. And his, his spirit is hurt too because uh, he doesn't know who his father is. You know, his father is uh, some, uh, uh, I think he's from, Por uh, he's a Portuguese man, but he's never met him. And someday we would like to find him. So that affects him. So also like uh, we, we deal with lots of uh, women and sometimes uh, they don't want to tell who the father is. Eh? And I always tell them, it's so important that your child knows who the father is. That's important because the child, it helps the child have an identity. You know, everybody needs a child, everybody needs a mother. And so I encourage them to tell, it doesn't matter what happened. I said, your child is here today and you need to give all the information you give to the child for the child to walk a good life on this earth, I tell them. So, but I find, you know, in order to be working with women, you have to be kind, you have to have empathy, and you cannot be judgmental. And don't, and also never to act shocked or anything if they <coughs> confide in you. You know, not to be shocked, those are lives. And all these things happen to them and they hurt. And that's how come they need help today. You know, and sometimes it takes a little while longer for some of them to, to come around because drugs and alcohol are so powerful. They just disrupt your spirit. You know, they take away so much out of you. And sometimes, you know, you know, loving yourself is the best medicine you can give to yourself instead of looking for love. You know, to love yourself and then you can love your children. You know, and also some of our, some of the things that we encounter is what we put in front of ourselves, you know, the obstacles that we impose on ourselves. That makes it difficult for us to move ahead, you know, looking at the future with a negative attitude, you know. So, you know, when we talk about getting well, getting well is totally, to be totally honest within ourselves, you know, to make choices for the best interest of everybody. When we make that choice, our children are going to benefit from it, our little children. Our future children that are going to come will benefit from it. And also to teach them things, teach them how to cook, you know, uh, how to clean up, how to do their laundry. Loving your child is teaching your child all these things that they need to know in their life. If you don't, if you don't teach the children, you know, in the near future, that might cause them to have a broken marriage because they don't know how to do anything, they don't know how to clean up, they don't know how to look after the, themselves, you know. And that goes for boys too. Teach the boys that, boys and girls. In this day and age, we need to teach both. Long time ago, men didn't have to do dishes except for their own dishes, you know, because they were hunters, they were providers. They would go out hunting and sometimes they would bring nothing. They would walk, go all day long to hunt and they would bring nothing. There was a lot of work, lots of sacrifice there. And the woman would look after their children. But times have changed now. Women have to work. We all have to work, you know, the price of living today. And we always have to help one another. You know, if one family is having a hard time, we pitch in to help. And like also the English jargon, like I have a very difficult time with English. Sometimes I say the wrong words and it doesn't make sense. If I could speak my first language, which is Creed, would make it a lot better. You know, and, uh, and sometimes like when we work with our people, we refer them to as clients. That one doesn't sit good with my spirit to be a client. You know, we have to learn to, uh, 
use this English in a healthier way. You know, maybe call, call our uh, families, you know, our participants, you know, to participate in wellness, participate in doing things together. But when you're a client, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, like, I don't like that word, client. So there's, uh, like, we all have to learn how to talk, you know, using the right words. It's like when we pray, you know, we choose the, we call that in our language, it means choosing certain words to use in your prayer and not to be selfish or not to be hurtful in your prayer, but choosing only what are chosen for you through spirit. You know, that's what my grandmother told us, because my grandmother was told that, you know, that was in our lives a lot because my father was in the war and we we're just little kids. Like, okay, so we have to, uh, go back to that teach our, our children i teach my grandchildren to pick so we pick enough sage to last us from season to season and also we pick sweet grass and even the gift of sweet grass you know people are so uh, kind and eager to teach everybody how to pick sweet grass eh? but sometimes them themselves don't know how to pick sweet grass you know they'll go and pick uh, grass They'll pick muskeg grass. They look identical, and they even smell sweet grass when when you smell it. But and then when you light it, it gives a dark smoke, and that's not sweet grass. Sweet grass is supposed to give a, a gray smoke, and also sweet grass is uh, it's uh, it curls. It's a very uh, it's, it's curly, eh? and then uh, and you braid it so gentle, like uh, you with prayer, you smudge yourself. Have good thoughts while you're bra braiding uh, sweet grass, and then you offer that to, to uh, people that want help. And what they do is they'll give you tobacco and a gift because to go and pick sweet grass it takes long hours. You have to search. You have to do an offering. You know, put gas in your vehicle, pack up a lunch, go over there all day long. You can pick sweet grass all day long. If you're lucky, you'll get sixty braids. But if you're kind of lucky, maybe 15 braids, and that's about five hours of uh, picking because they're all over. But if you know where the sweet grass is, then you can pick lots. One time, me and my family, there was about 14 of us, we went picking. You know, we ended up picking 165 braids. And I ha when I come home, I was so tired, you know, I was braiding in the vehicle. Kids were helping me to hold it. When I, I braided, then I could see children going to bed, going to falling, going to bed. Eh? And uh, finally, it was just me and my nephew. We braided till three in the morning, and we had to go outside, uh, you know, for fresh air because we we're just so uh, exhausted, you know, picking sweet grass all day long. But m my dad told us, when you pick sweet grass, look after it right away. That's what he t he taught us. So I do it that way. But I also see other people where they put a big pail of water and they stick the sweet grass out of there, and the sweet grass sits there all day. I seen that happen, but th that was never taught uh, to us. But we, ha so that's why you have to pick uh, just what you need, and then all that. So sweet grass we braid, we divided them. We gave some away to people that could not go picking sweet grass. We gave them away. So because that's what we do, we only kept enough for our ceremonies. And the way you live in your home, what you bring in your circle is what your children are going to benefit from. And so is uh, your friends, your relatives. You know, everybody's going to benefit from it, you know, leading a good life. And children are going to benefit more. They're going to do well in school. They'll have high grades. And to encourage the children to go to school and stay in school, if they're not going to school, find out why they're not going to school, they'll tell you. Because school is not for everybody. You know, when a, when a person is emotionally off balance, they can't learn. You can force them to learn, but they can't learn nothing. Say that goes for adults too. So we need to find out what's wrong, what's wrong with us. And when, when we find out what's wrong with us, we, uh, we can get well and we can stay well because everybody has a right to stay well, you know, and uh, 
you know, for, the, for our own future. We want a better future for our children, but it's getting harder and harder every year, you know, for education funding. All our treaty rights are getting kind of a, uh, we're losing our treaty rights right in front of our, uh, right in front of us. You know, they're slow in acting, but I believe that because of, uh, you know, our, uh, our First Nations, uh, you know, uh, jobs, they can do something about it. You know, but we need to be a part of it too. And how we're going to be a part of it is to get well and to stay well. Do everything we can, you know, to help each other. Like I find me to help women and children. That's what I like the best doing, you know. Helping teenagers, you know. Talking to them about life. That life is so short. Life is sacred. You bring a child into this world. You have to look after the child. Somebody's got to look after the child. Lots of work to a child. Lots, but you know, when you have, when you're stable, nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible at all. We can do everything we can. Mercy, good.